Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1952. We're going to be taking a look at Hank Williams and he's going to be playing through Cold Cold Heart. So let's get Hank and the Drifting Cowboys up on screen and see how they get on. Thank you, Roy. I've got a song here that I'd like to do that's been awful kind to me and the boys. It's bought us quite a few beans and biscuits. This is the best song we've ever had uh, financially. A little tune called Cold, Cold Heart. I try so hard, my have it that was a masterclass in tempo because it is so easy to start speeding up when you're playing live but the tempo is the thing that is so important with this particular composition and the message of the track as well because with country music we just had major chords always in the backing we have got an a seventh here but it's just d a seventh and g so we've got this major progression over the major chords it would be so easy if it was delivered in the wrong way to make the song sound happy when it shouldn't be because it's a serious topic and it's a sad song. It's delivered in such a way it still sounds sad and that's the beauty of country music is that it's got that direct contrast between happy chords but then the serious content that the artist might be singing about. I left in the intro on this particular video because it's great to hear somebody introducing a song and then just getting into it and playing and the band starting up and the voice sounding exactly the same as it did in the intro. Because nowadays there can be times when a singer will introduce a song and then when they start singing it's a totally different vocal sound to when they were just talking because of the effects that are added on as soon as they officially start 
start the track. But it's great here with Hank just straight in. And it's a shame that we can't see this in colour because it looks like he's got a rather dazzling shirt on catching the light. So the image was there as well. But it's so difficult to deliver the song in the way that Hank does and the whole band. We have the steel guitar going on as well. And this isn't a pedal steel guitar because those came in after 1953, which is unfortunately when Hank passed away. But having that sound is synonymous with country, fantastic playing. We have Don Helms here on steel guitar. And I was gonna say that the steel guitar playing and pedal steel guitar playing in country music has to be spot on because everybody knows what it should sound like. And it's guys like Don that made people almost take for granted great steel guitar playing because of the control of vibrato. The frequency that Don plays that vibrato with so even the whole time, but the deliberate slides into notes. But the technique is so spot on. And this is why if there is a bad pedal steel guitar player nowadays, they stick out like a sore thumb because back in the really early 50s, here is a great example of a player who had the technique down so well that they just express through the song. We've also got Jerry Rivers here on fiddle and the impressive thing about this performance, keeping the tempo that I mentioned earlier the whole way through the track, but everyone in the band playing with the same expression in relation to the tempo because it is so easy to get carried away and maybe slide into notes a little bit too quickly and lose the feel of the performance. But everybody here, this is why Hank Williams was so great as a performer because of his deliberate vocal delivery, but also his playing and the band that he was in front of knew exactly how to match that feel that Hank was giving with his delivery delivery out at the front of the stage. Hank Williams was one of those country artists who influenced so many other artists, but not just country artists. We have guys like Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash is in there, Bob Dylan, but also the Rolling Stones and Chuck Berry. His appeal just spread over so many different genres. And there's a reason for that because artists would see performances like this and see how professional it is musically. It's so easy just to sit back and listen to the story because that's a massive part of country music, telling a story and engaging the audience, which is definitely something that Hank Williams could do like no other. But then looking past that into that execution of the music live and just having a guitar, having a band, just introducing your song and just playing, just doing it and engaging everybody throughout the performance. There's a reason that Hank was inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame and the Songwriters Hall of Fame and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And he also had 35 top 10 hits and 11 of those did go to number one. So not only an instrumentalist, a singer, but a great songwriter. It all started for Hank when he was 14. He entered a competition at the Empire Theatre which he won and he went away with $15. Then because of this success, he was played occasionally on the radio, but he was requested a lot by people phoning in and he was given his own 15 minute show every week because of the demand. And it's funny because there is a little bit of a rumor, at least on the internet, that the reason that he was in demand so much was that his mum was ringing the radio station asking to hear more from that young boy who played that they occasionally featured. Due to the success Hank experienced on the radio, he set up the Drifting Cowboys and he left school at age 16 so that he could focus on music. And this now allowed him to go and play at different venues because he didn't have to be at school anymore. So the problem was that just a couple of years later when he was 18, 
His band, the Drifting Cowboys, were drafted for the war in 1941. But Hank had a back problem from birth that meant he wasn't drafted for war in 1941. And this can be linked and cited as a reason for his alcoholism and also taking of drugs, painkillers, in order to get rid of this pain that he was going through day by day because of the problem he had. So having lost his backing band, in 1942, Hank was drinking quite a lot and unfortunately got fired from his job at the radio. And that was for habitual drunkenness. And a year after that, he met Audrey Shepard. Audrey managed to get Hank's life back on track. By 1945, he had started back up at the radio station and he was now writing songs weekly that he would perform on the radio. So Audrey spoke to Fred Rose and he was from Acuff Rose Publishing Company and Audrey said about Hank and that maybe he could perform for Fred, which he did and Fred really liked the sound that Hank was making. So they signed him to Sterling Records and he had some releases with them, had an increase in popularity because of those releases and MGM came along and signed Hank up in 1947. Hank was being played regularly on the radio and his version of Lovesick Blues went to number one in the charts and it stayed there for four months. In 1949 is when he joined the Grand Ole Opry and he had previously auditioned for that but unfortunately wasn't accepted. I think the other thing to point out, especially for this generation, is getting an appreciation of what it was like to be played on the radio back in the 40s and the 50s because TV wasn't a thing yet and if it was a thing, very few people had it because it was such a new invention, it would have been very expensive and being able to get yourself on the radio, that's what everybody wanted and there weren't a great deal of radio stations. So rather than a family getting together and sitting down and watching TV every night, they would gather around a radio and listen to it. So if you could get yourself on the radio as a musician, it means that you had such an advantage over everybody else. It's interesting where this song originates because T Texas Tyler in 1945 had a song called You'll Still Be In My Heart and it was this song, but it wasn't these words. So hang Williams put these lyrics to this song and it became Cold Cold Heart. Back in the mid 40s, early 50s, I think the whole copyright thing was a bit of a shady area. So some of the tunes that were being played and sung, a lot of artists took that same song and then did their own version of it and called it a different song. But anyway, that's where Cold Cold Heart comes from. And these lyrics were the ones that Tony Bennett then used in his song, his cover of that particular song in 1951. This was around the time that Hank and and the Drifting Cowboys were hitting their peak 1951-1952 and to put it in perspective for each show that they played they made $1,000 which would be roughly $10,000 in today's money so like Hank said at the beginning of this performance it's really done well for them this particular track but just performing in general at this time unfortunately in 1951 Hank had a trip and a fall when he was hunting and this really aggravated his back and this is when he started to heavily rely on pain-killing drugs such as morphine and in that same year he went through a spinal fusion. So at the height of his popularity in 1952 is when he met Billie Jean Jones and he liked her quite a lot and would travel to go and see her. The only problem being that he would travel to see her when he should have been at the Grand Ole Opry shows and he would miss those and unfortunately he therefore got fired and the reason for that was habitual drunkenness. So the same thing he'd been fired for 10 years earlier at the radio station. But once he got fired from the Grand Ole Opry, he then went back to radio. In 1952, Hank started to experience heart problems. And I think this was due to the alcohol, but also the drugs that he was taking to reduce the pain from his back. 
And in that same year, he met Horace Toby Marshall. He didn't know that his name was Horace Toby Marshall because Horace was a bit of a con man. He'd been released from jail the year earlier, and that was for forgery, and he'd been known to use fake titles. He bought the Doctor of Science title for $25 and called himself Dr. C.W. Lemon. So Hank went to who he thought was a doctor and got prescribed amphetamines and morphine and various other drugs to help him deal with the pain in his back, but he didn't know at the time that he wasn't actually speaking to a real doctor. So Hank was taking a concoction of drugs and he was still drinking alcohol as well, which wasn't a great mix for his heart and the problems he was already feeling. On the 31st of December in 1952, he was due to play in Ohio, but he was going to fly there. There was a massive storm, so they couldn't fly. They got a student called Charles Carr to drive Hank to the venue, and that would then be delayed, so he'd perform on January the 1st in 1953, and it would just be a day's worth of delay. And they had sold three and a half thousand dollars worth of tickets for that particular show so it was a big event so Charles and Hank started their journey and Hank mentioned to Charles that he wasn't feeling particularly great so Charles stopped at a hotel and he could see the condition that Hank was in so he called a doctor and the doctor gave Hank an injection of vitamin B12 and morphine and when they checked out of the hotel Hank wasn't in great condition because they had to carry him to the car. So Charles continued on with Hank in the back of the car. They stopped at a place to get something to eat and he asked Hank if he wanted anything and he said that he didn't want anything and those turned out to be his last words because when they continued the journey they kept driving for a while and the next time Charles pulled over was at a gas station to fill up and when he looked in the back of the car he realized that Hank had died and rigor mortis had started to set in it's just that he hadn't noticed because he'd been driving in the autopsy the cause of death was stated as a hemorrhage in the heart and neck and insufficiency of the right ventricle of the heart and when the news has broken to the venue in Ohio, unfortunately, because the performance was already delayed by a day, they thought that it was a joke when it was announced that Hank Williams had died. So the audience laughed. But then as the night progressed, artists and bands that were booked for that evening were dedicating their performances to the late Hank Williams, who had died that day. And the audience started to understand that it was real, that Hank had actually died on January the 1st, 1953. The other thing about Hank's death is he's another one of these artists that was so influential in country music and his particular genre, but he influenced so many other artists that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. But he was only 29 years of age when he died, so he was still taken really early on and... I think because he had this problem with his back from birth, it was something that he always had to struggle with and taking drugs wasn't something that he did because of an enjoyment factor. It was just a necessity to get through every day without the pain that he would have been going through had he not been taking drugs. And like I mentioned, the alcoholism can be linked to that as well. And this unfortunate encounter that he had with a con man who he thought was a doctor. So what he was being prescribed and the amount of drugs that he was being prescribed was not being monitored by anybody who knew what they were doing. And when you add in the alcohol that Hank was drinking at the time as well, his body unfortunately just couldn't cope with what was being put into its system. Also, he was taken from a everybody at such a young age comparatively short career in terms of what he released and how long he was in the music industry but he had such a significant impact and inspired so many people including his son Hank Williams Jr. But thank you guys so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think and if you enjoyed this video please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock!